Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the show. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced his cabinet back on October 26th, and obviously everybody's quick uh, for some reactions, but joining me now to uh, react to the new cabinet a little bit after um, it was announced is former NDP leader Tom Mulcair. Uh, So Tom, now that we've had some time to kind of digest some of the new cabinet ministers, I think, you know, when the cabinet's first announced, everybody kind of jumps to conclusions quite quickly. But now that we've had a a couple of weeks to uh, digest some of the ministers, Anita Anand uh, has made some uh, big decisions already. Uh, But just what's your reaction to how some of the cabinet ministers have done so far? Well, I think that if you look at Mr. Trudeau's choices, you see that he's decided that he's really going to pursue some of the objectives he's been talking about since he arrived on the scene six years ago and never really had a chance to get to. So I think that, for example, his often stated claim about being a feminist is really uh, coming true this time, because if you look at the top level, you mentioned Anita Anand, we could talk about Christia Freeland, talk about Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie, or the President of the Treasury Board, whose name is Mona Fortier. You've got four women. Uh, at those uh, at the top level of the Canadian government. I don't think that there's another government in the G20 that has uh, as many prominent women at the top of, uh, of its cabinet like that. So it's a sign that Mr. Trudeau is following through on that uh, long-standing promise uh, of giving an important role to women. If we look, you mentioned it's the past couple of weeks. In the past couple of weeks, we've also been at the COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. And I think that Canada's got a phenomenal new environment minister and Stephen Gilbo and Mr. Trudeau again, going back to the Paris Accord, has talked a lot about this. It was clearly something he wanted to get done, but we haven't gotten around to it. And I think that Stephen Gilbo will allow Canada finally to play a more constructive role on the world stage with regard to, to climate and the environment. And I'll ask you um, another question regarding the cabinet shuffle and some of the new ministers. Harjeet Sajjan has moved from uh, defense to international development. But then um, is it is it interesting to you um, that somebody like Harjeet Sajjan remained in cabinet when someone like uh, Mark Garneau was out of cabinet and then someone like Bardish Chagger was out of cabinet? Is that any of interest to you? Well, I was surprised, uh, but I also think that, you know, he's a long-standing ally of Mr. Trudeau. His community is very important uh, to the Liberals, and I think that that's why he's still in Cabinet. He did not have an easy time of it when he was Defence Minister. Um, he had a lot of difficulty. Um, they've, they've still never given any real reason why Mark Garneau is no longer around. Uh, but, um, you know, he seems to have uh, reacted in a very gentlemanly fashion. I'm still expecting an announcement that Mr. Garneau is probably going to go on to an ambassadorship sometime before uh, Parliament resumes on November 22nd. But um, Mr. Trudeau, again, I mean, you know, he's gone for youth. He's gone for vitality. He's gone for change. And, uh, you know, Mr. Garneau had uh, done done his bit. And uh, Mr. Trudeau is showing uh, that it's one thing to get into cabinet, but you don't get to stay in there forever. Uh, He gets to choose the cabinet every time there's a new election. And um, you mentioned Stephen Gilbo in Glasgow, uh, Scotland. You've already kind of said that you think he was a good choice for environment. You said he was a phenomenal choice for the environment, but um, maybe speak a little bit about why you believe that and just some of his um, past, obviously, um, formerly with Greenpeace Canada, which I think was something that a lot of people uh, talked about. So maybe speak a little bit about why you think that. Well, I've known him for about 20 years and uh, uh, he's a person who's worked on the environment file for a long time. He's also somebody who has reached out. He was able to work with government, work with the private sector, understand it. He was not only a Greenpeace, but after that, he headed up a group, a very respected group called Equiterre. And um, I think he's just a a sterling choice. He's the type of guy who's going to be creative. He's going to find solutions and he's not going to accept to be told that it can't be done. And um, still kind of on the topic of cabinets, this time uh, the Conservative Shadow Cabinet uh, that was actually announced uh, just today. Um, they left out people like Leslyn Lewis, which I personally thought was uh, surprising. Many people thought she was kind of a shoe in to get into uh, the Shadow Cabinet. Um, but how big of an impact do you think this uh, inter-party caucus, the civil liberty uh, caucus that uh, the Conservatives are starting up, uh, Marilyn Gladue uh, is trying to create, is having on uh, their party's unity? Because especially because this is an issue that uh, they're already struggling on. I, do you think that this will um, not help them with it anymore? Or do you think it'll 
um, kind of demolish the political cycle. Like even at some of Aaron O'Toole's uh, press conferences, we saw um, that the majority of reporters' questions that he receives is on um, kind of the mandatory vaccination issue. So speak maybe a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a very good point, Wyatt. That's called being pushed off your message. So no matter what he's decided he wants to talk to the journalists about, they want to keep the conversation going about the few people in his caucus who refuse to be vaccinated and uh, the exclusion, for example, of Leslin Lewis. But I think it was important for Mr. O'Toole to show that he was the leader of the Conservative Party. Uh, he's got a strong case uh, to be made with regard to vaccinations. It caused him a lot of votes during the campaign. The Liberals were able to really convince people that he was trying to side with the anti-vaxxers, and that didn't help his cause at all, didn't help his numbers at all. So I think that um, it, it was the right thing to do, to, uh, to push back against people who were sending very bizarre messages. Uh, Marilyn Gladue uh, first among them, but Madame Gladue, has just apologized in, in no uncertain terms uh, for sending very bad messages with regard to the importance of being vaccinated. So I think that uh, O'Toole's being proven right. It was about, about high time that he put his foot down and said, enough's enough. You know, we can't have a party and, and have a deal with the voting public and then say we, we represent this and then have individual members of caucus saying, no, we don't. We represent something completely different. So I think that it was worthwhile uh, for Mr. O'Toole to, to start getting a little bit tougher on this. And do you think that, like, obviously, Mr. O'Toole has left the two of them out of shadow cabinet, but does it stop there? Because they still have a voice in caucus, their constituents still elected them. So how do you think they can, uh, Mr. O'Toole can move forward still with some MPs in his caucus who uh, are still speaking out against vaccinations? Well, I mean, it's two completely different things. If they want to go into a caucus room and say, we strongly disagree with your position on, on vaccines, that's fine. But once the leader makes the call and it's in conformity with the party policy, then you're you're breaking your promise to the public. Because when you try to get elected, you say, this is the, what we represent. These are the values that we represent. And there's a further problem with calling yourself this mini caucus, calling it the Civil Liberties Caucus. Is it almost is a black eye for everybody else in the Conservative Caucus saying, well, we care more than you do about civil liberties. I don't think that there's any evidence of that. So... Mr. Mr. O'Toole's had a lot of trouble dealing with this uh, since the election. In fact, the last week of the election was was poisoned by his having backed Jason Kenney's approach in Alberta, which turned out to be an absolutely misguided disaster. And so he had to walk that back. And so O'Toole was stuck with that. So I think it is about time for him to be able to start moving on. And by the way, naming his shadow cabinet today is a way to maybe to finally turn the page on that chapter. You mentioned naming his shadow cabinet is a bit of a, a way to start turning it. And I'll ask you one more question on this and then we'll go on to the final question. But um, do you think that like, what do you think has to be done in order to stop this from taking over the news cycle uh, for the conservatives? Well, I think that once they settle down and the session starts, it'll get a little bit easier. Now, if there are a few members of his caucus who do what they're putting on background, they're saying that they're actually going to try to make their way into the House of Commons without being vaccinated. If that were to come to pass, it would be a great embarrassment for the Conservative Party because it's not just about MPs amongst themselves, although they all deserve to be protected from this horrible disease as well. But there are hundreds of people who work in the House of Commons and it's not it's just not decent uh, behavior. So, I mean, Mr. O'Toole will actually have a much better hand to deal with them if any of them do take it upon themselves to behave in such a misguided manner. And uh, as a final question, the speech from the throne will be uh, delivered. What do you think are some of the priorities that the government should include in uh, the speech from the throne? Obviously, COP26, the Environment Minister Stephen Gilbo is in uh, Glasgow, the defense uh, portfolio. There's lots of interesting things. So do you expect many of those to be in the throne speech? Yeah, and they're also going to have to talk about pocketbook issues because the average Canadian family is going to start feeling the pinch of inflation. And, and that's something that my generation remembers, but not too many people on the younger side today had to live with that. But that takes away your, your purchasing power. So that's uh, something to keep an eye on. On a simply mechanical side for the delivery of the throne speech, because it's not the prime minister who delivers it, it's the governor general, of course, as you know. But uh, Mary Simon didn't speak French, not a word, when she got appointed. She's going to have to be working hard to be able to deliver several paragraphs, half that speech has to be in French. 
that's a very strong tradition. And if she's not able to do that convincingly, in the everything in politics takes place in a context, and sometimes things line up at the same time. And we've just been through a massive language kerfuffle with uh, the president of Air Canada not able to speak a single word of French. And that just makes it very difficult for Mr. Trudeau, who's always made official language as one of the cornerstones of his policy, as has the Liberal Party. So it's going to put him in a very tight spot if his hand-picked appointment for Governor General cannot convincingly show that she's actually got enough French to deliver half that speech in that language. All right, Tom. Well, that was my final question. So thank you again for joining me today. It's been great talking with you and talk to you again soon, hopefully. Great to talk to you as well, Wyatt. All the best. Bye-bye.